Our fourth lecture in the series is going to be on the cell cycle. Um, for this you should be able to describe the four phases of the cell cycle and explain how the proteins called cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases function. You should also be able to explain the role of positive and negative regulators of the cell cycle, how the cell cycle affects disease and also how it can be pharmacologically targeted. So just to introduce the topic, um, the human body contains an estimated 10 to the power of 14 cells and about 1 by 10 to the power of 11 or 0.1% of these uh, of this total divide each day. So that's still an awful lot of cells that are actively dividing every single day of our lives. Neurons and skeletal muscle rarely divide. In fact, these, in some instances, have become post-mitotic, meaning they no longer undergo mitosis cell division. Cells that do undergo a lot of cell division include cells of the bone marrow, which are responsible for creating blood cells, and also the lining of the gastrointestinal tract, so the epithelial cells um, divide daily also. About the same number of cells are dying, and we'll be talking about cell death and in particular apoptosis in the next lecture. So why do we need cells to divide? Well a lot of them are obviously involved in growth but others are involved in repair processes and also in defense of our body um, via the immune system. In some instances division of cells can be dangerous and lead to hyperplasia and in some conditions lead to um, the formation of tumours or tumorigenesis. Uh, during cell division, a cell replicates all of its components and divides into two identical daughter cells. The cell cycle is thought to, to have four distinct phases. And these are outlined below. Um, these are G1, S, G2 and M phases. There's also another phase which is called G0, um, which is considered to be outside of the cell cycle. Well, the four main phases are G1, which is a gap phase following mitosis, where the cell will grow and prepare for DNA synthesis. The S, which, which stands for synthesis, is where DNA replication occurs, which we covered in the first lecture. Um, G2 is a second gap phase that occurs before mitosis, and the cell prepares for the next mitotic division. The M phase is what you would know as uh, mitosis, or in the case of germ cells, meiosis. And this is where the cell um, separates into two identical daughter cells. Um, as we said already, the G0 phase is where quiescent cells uh, exist outside of the cell cycle, so they don't actively divide, but in order to divide, they need to re-enter at G, uh, G1, and this can be induced by certain chemicals, in particular growth factors. So this is just showing you a diagrammatic form of what we've just said. You have the G1 phase where you have the uh, the growth, the first growth phase or uh, gap phase. Um, the DNA replication occurring at the S phase. And the second gap phase is right before uh, mitosis. So all three of these phases, G1, S and G2, would be considered um, interphase. So these are the bits that are... Uh, outside of mitosis but still in the cell, cell cycle process. The M phase consists of uh, prophase, metaphase, anaphase and telophase and these are the subphases of um, the M um, section of, of the cell cycle. So just a, a recap on mitosis and we said that it consists of prophase, metaphase, anaphase and telophase. Um, during prophase uh, the nuclear envelope breaks down and you can visibly see chromosomes and spindle forms and this is shown uh, in the diagram on the right in the, the second um, the, the, the second part of the diagram um, the metaphase which is the, the third part of the diagram um, is where the chromosomes will align on a spindle that has been formed uh, the anaphase is where these chromosomes are separated and they move to the poles of the cells so they're being pulled apart by the spindle 
and finally the telophase then is where the chromosome or chromatin uh, decondenses and it reforms intact nuclei. The last part of the mitosis process is called cytokinesis where the cell will be pinched in two along the midline. So there's a, as indicated by the diagram, there's a cleavage furrow and the formation of now two distinct daughter cells. So cell cycle um, is essential for life. It needs to proceed um, perfectly every single time if we're to get uh, the formation of two identical daughter cells with no damage done to it. So there are a number of checkpoints that are built in to the process. Um, this is indicated by the diagram on the slide. Uh, in particular, things that need to be checked are uh, the DNA replication. Has the, all of the DNA re been replicated? Um, is the environment favourable? So the cell may find itself in an unfavourable environment and it may be better off to wait to a later stage before it starts dividing. Um, is the cell big enough? Is um, the, are, the chromos are all the chromosomes aligned on the spindle? Uh, and these are the types of things that need to be considered at each particular checkpoint. So these checkpoints are essential to the proper working of the cell and of the cell cycle. Very briefly, I'd like to just mention um, two particular um, uh, protein uh, modifications which can occur in cells. Um, these are phosphorylation and proteolysis. Um, and these are two processes that are essential to understanding uh, what happens during the cell cycle. So during phosphorylation, a protein can be phosphorylated or have a, a phosphate group added to it by an enzyme called a kinase. This will generally require energy in the form of ATP being, being converted to ADP and the phosphate group from this being donated to a specific amino acid on the protein, usually a serine, a threonine um, or a tyrosine. And this phosphorylation event is usually used as a form of signaling, a way of telling the protein uh, something or passing on information and we'll see that uh, shortly in the um, initiation and uh, termination of the cell cycle. A second process which can occur is proteolysis and these this is the breaking up um, of protein at particular points on the protein structure and it's usually carried out by enzymes known as proteases. So cyclins are key proteins to the cell cycle and they were discovered about 40 years ago and they're proteins whose level change during the cell cycle. Um, they increase uh, by altering transcription, meaning that the genes coding for cyclins are read, they're transcribed and they're translated eventually. Um, and these uh, different cyclins increase at, at different phases of the cell cycle at the G, G1, S, G2 and M phases. Uh, but they also decrease at different phases and these decreases are caused by degradation, usually by um, specific degradation mechanisms. In addition to that, these cyclins bind to particular proteins called cyclin-dependent kinases and as the name suggests, these are kinases which phosphorylate specific proteins, so they're enzymes. The timing of the cyclin gene expression activates the cyclin-dependent kinase complexes and different cyclin-dependent kinases bind different cyclins so they have uh, certain binding partners and there's many cyclins and there's many cyclin-dependent kinases which we'll see shortly. The activity is also dependent on the proper phosphorylation of the cyclin-dependent kinase often on multiple sites and often in a particular distinct sequence. This is just the exam an example of one such uh, sequence of events where you have the combination of a mitotic cyclin and a cyclin-dependent kinase. You'll also see this in the diagram that it has particular letters and numbers, and these numbers and letters indicate specific phosphorylation events. Uh, Y15 means tyrosine amino acid at position 15 on the cyclin-dependent kinase, and T161 means threonine at position 161. Um, so these are two key amino acids on the cyclin-dependent kinase that need to be phosphorylated. Um, so 
When the cyclin and cyclin dependent kinase combine, they are still inactive, they can't actually do anything. But sequentially with the activation of it via phosphorylation, they become more active and they create a substrate binding surface. Um, so the first of these events is the phosphorylation at position 15 on the tyrosine by a kinase known as we one So we one phosphorylates tyrosine 15 and this is actually an inhibitory event. The next step involves the um, an enzyme called CAK and CAK phosphorylates threonine 161 and this is activating but it needs to remove the phosphate from tyrosine 15 first. Uh, so the third event then that's needed is a phosphatase. So a phosphatase removes phosphate groups and in this case it's a phosphate, phosphatase called CDC25 and this removes the phosphate group from tyrosine 15 in order to activate the cyclin dependent kinase complexes. Um, so once this is active it's able to act upon its substrates but in addition to that there's also the ability to inhibit it and these, this occurs by the use of cyclin dependent kinase inhibitors. So cyclin dependent kinase complex as mentioned um, are active in different phases of the, of the cell cycle. So different cy uh, cyclins uh, have their expression increased at different times and this corresponds to them activating different cyclin dependent kinase complexes. This is shown in the diagram on the on the slide, whereby at each phase there there is a distinct cyclin cyclin dependent kinase complex activated for that particular phase, and each of these is involved in initiating a series of events necessary to, to progress to the next phase of the cell cycle. So if we begin in G one, you can see that in G one there are a distinct number of cyclin dependent kinase complexes that are active at that particular stage not only that but they seem to be distinct for the different stages of the g1 cycle in particular cyclin d seems to be active very early on and it combines with cdk4 uh, later on it combines with cdk6 and finally cyclin e gets transcribed and combines with cyclin dependent 2 this is involved in activating the transcription of the S phase cyclins. So the cyclins that need to be increased for the S phase get activated at this particular time. Um, when we move on to S phase, the S phase then, which is when we get DNA replication, it is involved in activating pre-replication complexes. So how is the cell to know when to begin DNA replication? Well, it receives its signal from these S phase CDK complexes. And in particular, cyclin A is able to combine with cyclin dependent kinase 2. Moving on to G2 and finally M phase, there's a different set of cyclins and cyclin dependent kinases that are active in this phase. And these are generally involved in preparing the cell for. Um, mitosis and cell division. So it activates the chromin condensation that we see in um, in prophase. It initiates the breakdown of the envelope, of the nuclear envelope. It starts to initiate the formation of, of, of spindles and after a while then it will then degrade the mitotic cyclins and trigger uh, telophase and eventually the pinching of the cell to form um, the two daughter cells. So each of these cyclin dependent kinase complexes are necessary for the beginning, for the initiation of the next phase in the cell cycle. So again, this is just summarizing what we've been talking about, where we have uh, cyclin D, cyclin E, cyclin A, and cyclin B being transcribed and being active at different times. So this all um, occurs at distinct times uh, during each of these cell cycle phases. They also combine, as we've been saying, with cyclin -depend different cyclin-dependent kinases in order to drive the cell cycle through to the next phase. So while the cyclins increase due to transcription, their concentrations also periodically fall through the cell cycle, and this is driven by proteolysis. So the timing of the pro proteolysis ensures that the each of the cyclin complexes um, are inactivated in preparation for the next phase. 
So cyclins are usually degraded by something called the proteasome, and the proteasome is a multi-protein subunit um, uh, uh, unit complex which breaks down cellular protein. So it cleaves proteins that are ubiquitinated. And ubiqu ubiquitination is a specific post-translational modification. So these proteins are tagged in advance, they're recognized by the proteasome, and they're broken down by proteolysis. So if we want cells to divide in our, in our body, it needs, they need to receive a positive signal. If we want to stop cell division, we need to provide a negative signal. These signals are provided by substances known as mitogens. So mitogens are molecules that induce the entry into the cell cycle. So you can have a cell that's resting, that's um, not dividing, and it will keep on uh, remaining in a resting state unless it receives a signal of, of some kind. This is known as a mitogen. And mitogens activate uh, signaling pathways that regulate the cell cycle. They include things like growth factor, like epidermal growth factor, as well as some non-physiological chemicals as well that are able to induce proliferation of cells. Um, so the diagram at the bottom shows two cellular states, one of a resting cell where you have no cell division, you have no active um, gene transcription. Um, and then in the second case, in diagram B, you have a proliferating cell where you have the binding of a growth factor to a growth factor receptor a series of intracellular signaling events, usually driven by phosphorylation, and then uh, activation of key proteins inside the nucleus of the cell, which will then cause the transcription of genes. Um, in particular, these genes will not just be random genes, they'll be genes specific for driving the cell cycle. And you'll see this in the diagram whereby um, the the um, signaling usually activates uh, particular transcription factors that are responsible for binding to um, genes such as cyclins uh, which are involved in driving forward the next phase of the cell cycle. So as we've been saying growth factors induce the expression of particular genes in particular transcription factors and transcription factors uh, the most, I suppose, one of the most important transcription factors in driving the cell cycle is something called E2F. So E2F uh, expression is required for the passage through the, the, the what's called the restriction point of the cell cycle. And you can see in the diagram, E2F is generally bound to something called RB. So RB is a negative inhibitor of E2F, and without, um, with with RB attached to it. E2F as a transcription factor can't drive transcription. It can't uh, lead to increased transcription of cyclins, for example. So in order for the cell cycle to proceed, you need to get rid of RB. And this happens by phosphorylation. So phosphorylation of RB causes the RB protein to detach from E2F. This leaves the E2F molecule to be free and allows it to move to distinct gene locations, distinct promoter regions, and in particular those of the cyclins. So it will um, promote the transcription of specific genes, such as cyclins. Um, once this has occurred and we don't want it to happen anymore, E2F can be phosphorylated, in particular by cyclin-dependent kinase complexes that it has just been responsible for inducing the transcription of. When E2F is phosphorylated, it can no longer bind DNA, so it is almost like um, a negative feedback loop. So when it can't bind DNA, it can't cause the increased gene transcription of these specific cyclins. So E2F is normally responsible for inducing expression of DNA for things as CDK, such as CDK2, cyclin E and cyclin A. In addition to positive regulators, there are also some negative regulators of the cell cycle, and we've mentioned already RB protein. RB stands for retinal retinoblastoma protein, and in G1 phase of the cell cycle, it binds to E2F. And this causes it to inhibit E2F, meaning that E2F can no longer bind to DNA and cause transcription. So RB can be phosphorylated by the CDK complexes, in particular CDK4 combined with cyclin D and also by CDK2 combined with cyclin E. Uh, 
Phospho or B, as we've been saying, can't bind uh, E2F. Um, in addition to that, other negative regulators include the cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors. So once the cyclin-dependent kinase cyclin complex has been formed, it too can be inhibited. And known substances, known endogenous proteins, uh, particularly P21, are able to bind to and inactivate the cyclin CDK complexes. And this can cause cell cycle arrest in early G1 or in G2. And this allows DNA repair to take place. So this is advantageous if there's an insult to the cell, if it's been damaged somehow, or if there's been a mistake during DNA replication. And it allows the cell to stop, the cell cycle from progressing. It allows DNA repair to take place, or in some cases, it allows the cell to kill itself. This may be advantageous um, given the fact that if DNA was replicated or damaged permanently, the DNA would no longer be able to replicate correctly and pass on the correct genetic information to the next generation of cells and potentially may cause the induction of mutations which then get passed on uh, to successive generations of cells. So during the cell cycle, as we mentioned already, there are a number of checkpoints and there are these are points in the cell cycle where the cell can pause for a moment until the conditions for progression are met. Uh, in particular, things like in G1, we can check um, for DNA damage so that it's not replicated um, and carried on to the next generation. Um, in S phase, if there's any unreplicated DNA that needs to be replicated, it allows time for it to do that. Uh, in G2, if there's any kind of DNA damage, that needs to be fixed before we go on to mitosis and then finally during mitosis if there's been improper spindle formation or separation of the spindles um, during uh, the final phases of, of, uh, of, of mitosis. Uh, one molecule that I'd like to give particular attention to is P53 and P53 is a transcription factor again which has the ability to induce transcription and it's 53 kilodaltons in size, hence the name P53 protein of 53 kilodaltons, as it's known as. And this has been nicknamed the guardian of the genome because it has the ability to save the cell from damaging mutations. Uh, its concentration is low in normal cells, but the protein accumulates when DNA damage occurs. So as the diagram has indicated, this can occur from things like x-rays or gamma radiation or even chemicals that can attach to a bind and damage the DNA structure. Um, when this occurs, uh, P53 becomes activated. So there's a protein kinase that becomes activated as a result of DNA damage, which then is able to phosphorylate P53. And P53 normally, as we said, the levels are low, but it's also bound to its inhibitor, which is called MDM2. And MDM2 is there to keep the P53 in check. Uh, when P53 gets phosphorylated, it's uh, able to dissociate from the MDM2 protein, and it's able to bind to DNA. So as a transcription factor, it can bind to the promoter region of specific genes that it's able to recognize, and in particular, it combined to P21. So P21 usually gets transcribed and translated. And as we said already, P21 is a CDK inhibitor protein. And this is able to inhibit the CDK complexes, which are responsible for driving the cell cycle forward. So when this happens, the P21 is able to inhibit the cell cycle. The cell cycle stops. And as a result, the DNA can be assessed for damage. If the damage is um, manageable, if the DNA is able to be repaired, it will be repaired and the cell cycle initiated again. However, if the damage is too much, the DNA will be destroyed as well as the cell uh, rather than continue on any uh, potentially damaging uh, changes in the DNA. So, in particular, this has huge relevance for diseases like cancer where cells are proliferating when they should not. Um, there are some situations where genes called oncogenes when they get mutated they cause cancer because they uh, continually uh, activate the cell cycle meaning the cell will keep dividing and keep dividing in addition to that we've also mentioned 
uh, proteins like p53 and p53 is known as a tumor suppressor however if p53 is mutated or if its function is stopped for if it if, it, if it's um, inhibited in any way this can stop the um, the p53 from working meaning that the dna uh, can be damaged and that damage can cause mutation and that mutation then can carry on to further cells that are that are actually made so many anti-cancer drugs actually target the cell cycle. Um, in particular, they can target checkpoints in the process. Um, they can also damage DNA and induce proteins like P53 and cause the, the cell death of uh, tumor cells. Um, they've also been used to inhibit spindle formation during uh, mitosis and also to prevent DNA synthesis or, or DNA replication. So in summary, um, there's four distinct phases of the of the cell cycle. Um, key proteins include cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases, and they function together to regulate the cell cycle. And there's a number of positive and negative regulators of the cell cycle. Um, diseases like cancer can arise due to uncontrolled cell cycle, and this can be targeted pharmacologically to treat cancer also.